PowerPoint things before, so it's been torture. And I, I, didn't, I didn't get it as good as I really wanted it, so I apologize to the photographers especially. And I couldn't get all of them in. I didn't have, I ran out of time. Bobcats, yes, we have bobcats. More than one, I think. I'm not going to identify everyone. I'm afraid I'll say the wrong bird. Even though I'm a member of Eagle Audubon. <laughs> We have quite a few foxes, you've probably all seen them. Sometimes near the road, I've heard. And we had what my husband said was the biggest raccoon he ever saw outside our lanai on Lindhurst uh, the other night. He got the kit, the cat likes to sit on the lanai in the dark and watch things. My husband said that that, that, that raccoon would easily get the cat. Those are wood ducks. Um, they were taken in Kings Point, that photo. Is Betsy here? Let's see her. Um, anyway, but I also know they're at the Window in the Woods where um, our club Eagle Audubon has a, a viewing area. That's, that's the wood stork, the great blue heron. That's an anhinga in the middle of a catch, and um, Jimmy. I couldn't use your video, but he has a video where it shows the whole progression, but I could only do a slide, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> That's a glossy ibis. Um, there'll be a white ibis later. We, we have a lot of ibis in here. And you'll probably see them now that it's, maybe it's going to rain. They're usually out. Great blue heron. Great blue heron. Great egret. Some of these I forget their names. <laughs> That's a good shot of an osprey. Looks like he's ready to go down on a fish somewhere. It's a tricolor heron. They used to be called uh, Louisiana heron, but now the correct word is tricolor. Another shot. That's a warbler, but I don't know what kind. I'm not really good at warblers. They'll be migrating through soon. Fort DeSoto is a good place to see those. That's a turtle. Again, I don't know the kind. I think somebody here does, though. Soft shell. Yeah, I thought it was soft something. <laughs> That's a grackle. There's the white ibis. It's got to be the ugliest bird, but <laughs> they're very interesting. Black crowned, yellow crowned. I never get them right. There's a Male grackle. A bra, no, a good cut. Boat tail grackle. Oops, I lost, my, I lost my arrow. It's time for us to really start. Um, that's a bluebird. That's actually my picture. That's our bluebird house. That was a couple of years ago. It's a male bluebird bringing a worm or a bug or something. This is the one we all see all the time. <laughs> We have lots of them in here. And I think I'm back at the beginning, the blue jay. That's a warbler. That looks like they're having a chat. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out today on this beautiful sunny day. It's very sunny just above the clouds. Um, <laughs> My name is Rob Davies. I'm the chairperson of the uh, Pond Committee under the Master Association. And we've been meeting for about a year and a couple of months. Uh, one of the first and most important things that we're doing is educational activities. This is our fourth seminar on ponds. Um, we have a lot to do with our ponds over time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. 
um, about what we've learned so far. Um, but right now we have a wonderful speaker and Anne will introduce her. Thank you. speaker and where to go. <laughs> I'm Ann Whitehall. I'm a member of the Galatabon Society. Um, I want to thank the photographers that provided those photos. I We had a few more, but I didn't get to. Betsy Osman, are you here, Betsy? I thought sure she was coming. Um, and Jimmy Culp. I know Jimmy's here. He doesn't want to stand up. All right, we got a grant last fall, and planting's about to begin. Um, it's called the Plants for Birds. The Eagle Audubon applied for it and got it. The goal of the grant was to supply the funds to plant a minimum of six ponds with native Florida plants. The purpose was to reduce stormwater pollution and enhance pollu po pollinators and wildlife, such as fish and birds. And our club knew that it wasn't, you know, we represent a large area, not just Kings Point, but we felt by picking Kings Point, we could be an example to other HOAs and COAs in the area. Um, okay, so the, the funds were provided, I always have to say this, by Florida Audubon and the Florida Power and Light. Now, where is Kate? Time for Kate. Welcome, Kate. Kate, I forgot to ask you how you pronounce your last name. Kate Bordos? Close enough. <laughs> Kate is a Maine na native. She started out as a snowbird. She lives down in Venice um, uh, in a community much smaller than Kings Point, a lot smaller but in similar situations with ponds. She's now a permanent resident. She was a snowbird, and she's been a permanent resident since 2012. More or less. More or less. Kind of like, about like me. Yeah. Still well, that's okay. But I read that up in Maine, you were active too in environmental things. She's a master Florida naturalist and a certified interpretive guide. And she's given presentations in um, Port Charlotte, uh, Charlotte County and Sarasota counties, and I kind of had to beg her to come up here. Um, <laughs> well, I had to convince you. She wanted to do a Zoom, and we did not want to do a Zoom. We wanted her here, so or I did anyway. <laughs> Welcome, and I know she's going to be interesting. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, the question was raised by Anne about that little bobcat. I think we have a lot here, she said. Well, I will tell you that the females have a, a territory of five square miles each, approximately. And so you may have many females. The males have a territory of 25 square miles. So just think about that ratio for a minute. The boy is getting, having a good time on his 25 square miles. So I was asked to talk about ponds today, and I did offer to uh, bring a kind of a, a more technical, scientific presentation, and Anne said, no, no, we really want to understand the magic of ponds, how they work, because they really are very complicated uh, habitats, their environments. And so, what, but I did think I would just sort of ramp it up a little bit. I'm going to try to stand so that I'm not blinded by that. Okay, that's a little better for me. So I wanted to talk about what's in a pond. And what's in a pond is primarily water. So in Florida, we get approximately six, 60 inches of rain a year. Most of it falls in the summer. And um, if it weren't for specific environmental conditions, I'm talking pre-European, all of that water would just run off and we'd essentially be living um, in 
a, a, des a desertified uh, habitat. But that's not how it works. In nature, how it works is we have a particular hydrology in Florida where there's a very porous top layer and then a non-porous underlayer of myaca soil so that when the rain falls in the summer, it falls onto depression marshes and it, def and it falls onto wet and dry prairie and the water is held. So that water, it sits, it seeps, it moves very slowly. There's a, a slow sh um, sheet flow that occurs. But when the Europeans came, they said, well, we, we want to build houses and we can't have uh, soggy land for six to eight months of the year. So they began uh, building canals, digging canals to try to drain the water, but that wasn't terribly effective. And then this is Marco Island, so then it would be a real dredging and creation of, of dry land. And we've continued on that pattern. So one of the things that um, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, is that we have lost all that uh, porous surface and we've replaced it by non-permeable surfaces. All of these roads, these roofs, when the water falls, what comes of that water? Does it seep quietly through the system? It does not. When it comes, it can no longer seep, it becomes runoff. So you hear those two terms used interchangeably, they're not interchangeable. Sheet flow is the natural process, runoff is when you uh, consolidate and accelerate that flow and that becomes runoff, it can be erosive. And this is what runoff looks like. It looks like this and it can be potentially very destructive in terms of erosive power. Not only that, we lose tremendous amounts of water to runoff because instead of slowly seeping into the surfical aquifer, the deep aquifer, um, and staying in the system, we're losing 55% in runoff. And runoff is not what we want in our watershed because it's filthy. It has picked up all sorts of muck. The real <laughs> netting this out, the real problem is that the deep aquifers in Florida are not being uh, replenished. And no, we know the thousand people a day who move here insist on drinking, taking showers, and flushing their toilets, and we are running out of water. And we're continuing to develop. So one of the ways, um, I don't know if you have the unified development code here, but, but uh, new developments are required to put in uh, storm water management ponds. Can anybody take a look at this picture and tell me what this pond is doing wrong? There are two things that jump out to me. Yes? They are mowing to the edge. Bad, 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 bad. What's the other thing? No plants. No pl oh, there are three things wrong. <laughs> there are no emergent plants. And the other thing is, is the fountain. The fountain is the death of a thousand cuts to a pond. Yes, they look pretty, but every little, every little uh, wave that hits the edge is mildly erosive and they add up. So just before I start the actual program, I just wanted to talk about what stormwater ponds are because we're not talking about um, natural habitats. I, I don't know about this county, but in Sarasota County, there was not one natural pond in all of Sarasota County. It was depression marshes. They're not the same thing. So this is what a stormwater pond does. It takes uh, storm water in the form of runoff. It filters it. And then when the water then is transferred through the filtering system into the watershed, it's cleaner than it would have been had the runoff just hit, hit straight from the surface. Any questions about that so far? No. Shall I go on then? This is the, so as I say, that was a kind of recap of the technical part of it. So what we're doing is we are asking 
these man-made structures to replicate nature in a way that actually didn't exist. That's a, that's a big ask. We, we look out at these ponds and you know, we, we just look at them and they're pretty and I want it to be pretty the way I want it to be pretty. Well, not so much. They have to work in a certain way. And I would just tell you right now, uh, we talked about Venice Golf and Country Club where my husband and I live, 30 years old, 27 ponds. These ponds, as built, are designed to last about 25 years. And that's when they're treated right. Did we treat ours right? No, 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 no. No. So there comes a, there comes a time when you hit a step event and you just got to make things right. You just got to do it. Put your big boy pants on and just do it. So here we are. So this is the start of our story. We're going to talk about a day in the life of a pond. Now, many of these photographs of mine, not all of them, many of these photographs are taken from my house, including this one. So we're going to start in the day in the life of a pond. And when you think of a pond, if you're like me, the image of a pond is the surface of a pond. That is so not the pond. The pond is um, a very complex uh, ecosystem. It has many, many, and we're going to look at a lot of these, uh, many inhabitants, all of whom have to manage a, a limited resource. And so this is, if anybody goes to their study for uh, master naturalist study, you go to bed state resource partitioning, resource partitioning. That is how many creatures get to thrive. So we're also gonna look at trophic transfer. Trophism is a term in Greek that can mean food or energy or sometimes both. And so we're gonna learn how energy gets into the pond and travels through the food web in the pond. So good time as any. Now looking at this picture, you can tell that this was taken some time ago because we've mowed to the edge. We mowed right to the edge. Currently we have a six to 10 foot no mow zone. Was it popular? It was not. Did we explain to people how we were saving them money? Yes, we did. Did they learn to like it? Not really, but they don't complain anymore because they understand that we're saving big money in terms of remediation for erosion. At the edge, who said that was an ugly bird? Anne, Anne, there are no ugly birds. <laughs> this is uh, a wood stork, naturally a wood stork. Oh, I misheard. <laughs> yes, yeah, so so the, there are a lot of birds in a the pond. There tends to be the ponds the size of ours, only a single uh, great blue heron. They, they uh, seem to own the territory, but other birds uh, will share. Uh, so they're, they're dividing the resource based on the size of the bird, the size of the beak, and in this instance, different size birds, same size beak and you know what they are, the great egret. These are birds have different uh, hunting habits, which I think we get to. Also different hunting, there's the great egret is, is, a, is a poison strike and the white ibis is more of a forager and that's how they do, um, they get their food. The wood stork has the most amazing, has anybody seen a wood stork feed? Yes. They have these lovely pink feet. Oh, there we go, lovely pink feet. And um, they go along, I realize I've been out of your camera shot for a no, little while. No, you haven't. You okay, did. thank you. you can move uh, so they go along and they rub the muck with their feet and they swing that great big beak back and forth. And when they feel something, so beaks are not like fingernails, you know. They are fully enervated. They, can, they have different nerve and sensors all the way from the tip right up to the gape. And when they feel something, they snap shut the 
snap reaction of a wood stork is the fastest response of any vertebrate. It happens just like that. But he can't find everything, because if his beak's over here, what's over here is sometimes uh, left behind. And so you'll often, when you see wood storks um, foraging, they'll have a line of birds behind them to get to pick up what got rustled up but left behind. So we have these two birds are kiting. Just, you know, you think of a kid with a kite, the kite's on the end. Um, and they can hover like this, but they're not in competition because they're after different size prey. The belt is a female belted and a male offspring. So those are the birds that maybe dive. Then we have the birds that are, are kite. Then we have the dabblers. Um, I do a program for beginning birders about uh, mallards, we, we, uh, I, I won't go down that road, but these are the birds that dabble. They're after vegetation. And then those that dive for prey. The pied bill grebe doesn't breed here, but they're winter residents. The cormorant and the anhinga have very similar techniques. They both have very little in the way of subcutaneous fat, which allows them to avoid the buoyancy problem of diving deep. And they, they, uh, they do, the anhinga goes the deepest and spears, the double-crested cormorant goes less deep and grabs. <laughs> this, because I don't know how far you are from the Gulf here, but where we are, it's just a few miles, and when conditions change, um, I put these in because they're just, it's so interesting. When it gets cold, the birds that are feeding in the Gulf or in the estuaries, the, the fish have gone down too deep for them to reach, so they come into ponds. So what, particularly when it's cold, it's a good idea to go out and watch the, watch the ponds because you're going to get some pretty exotic visitors, like this tern, this royal tern. Um, especially in the... Well, we, we now have our black-bellied whistling ducks a permanent residence, and the killdeer come on in. A few times when we have a real drought in our littoral shelves, which I will discuss, the littoral shelves become mud flats, and so we're starting to get birds that are more uh, readily found in marsh conditions. Uh, one of the most thrilling events for us was we were visited for over a few days by a pair of black skimmers. What they were doing in a pond, I have no idea. I have no idea but it was pure magic. These are not my pictures. One of the neighbors is, is, is a, a fine photographer, but we just couldn't get a picture. But this is what they looked like. They were wonderful birds to see. Another bird that will come in during cold weather is the white, the American white pelican, which uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but breeds up in the Midwest and in Canada Plains in huge, huge uh, colonies and then comes down and rests up. They don't dive. They scoop for their food. And when the when cold weather, fish go down, pelicans come into freshwater ponds. Both the both brown and these American white pelicans. So we also around ponds have scavengers. When an eagle, an eagle does not like to get wet. And so what it does when it's hunting, it comes up behind a swimming fish, grabs it, and then continues on just above and horizontal parallel to the water and then gets some lift. And that is unlike our specialist, the osprey that dives deep, uh, fixes on the prey, triangulates the prey, and then just comes on down. Now, what's not clear when you're looking at a, an osprey that's either on the nest is how very long their legs are. They're about twice as long as they appear to be, and they need that length. That is how they catch the fish. So down it comes. You can see he's got that landing gear coming out, and down here he's taking his 
or this, I can't tell if it's he or she, but taking those four claws and the talons, and instead of having three in the front and one at the back, has switched the outside talons. So he's got two in the front and two in the back, and he's got these lovely, um, let's see, we probably have a better picture coming up. Like the scale of this is so hard for me to feel. There we go. And you can see there are these nice little pads, really get good purchase on that fish never taking his eyes off, and he's going in feet first. Now, are you a fish? Just imagine for a minute you're a fish. Are you excited about being eaten? <laughs> no, 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 no. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna dive. And this is where the length of the legs comes in handy because he can be taken down quite some distance, but because of very specific flight pattern with those wings, can get really flap himself up and out of a pond. And there you can see a better look at the, the length of the legs and, and the pads and the, the movement of the, the, the outside talon. And there we go. Yeah, and they line it up. They line it up um, aerodynamically. So we have other hunters. <clears throat> The kestrel, a falcon, and a red-shouldered hawk. This is a beautio. Comes in a number of different uh, morphs here in Florida. With the gatherers, I I rather like the black vultures. They tend they at least I anthropomorphize, but they tend to seem very uh, tender to each other. They mate for life. There's a lot of aloe grooming. Um, Unlike their friends, the turkey vultures, who are in it, seem to be, this is just my one woman's take on birds. The turkey vultures seem to be in it for themselves. They don't play well with others. <laughs> so then we have birds. We, we will get away from birds eventually, but there are a lot of birds in the pond, and it's what we see. So it's worth, so we have the green heron, the black crowned night heron both of whom stay very still and then dart in for the kill. And we have the gregarious birds, the, the coot, the American coot, and the common gallinules used to be called moorhens. And so these are two of the few birds that actually breed in the pond vegetation. They like um, any kind of reed and rush. And they have the, they, because of the weight distribution, on their feet, they do. They can walk on not water, but they can walk on on large vegetation. So we have generalists. We have the beautiful snowy, the great blue, and specialists. Now, specialists. Um, this particular specialist has gone missing. In our ponds, they feed. Uh, you can see up up here on the Florida um, apple snail. They do feed on other mollusks, but this is their favorite one. Their, their beaks are a combination of tweezers and a corkscrew. So they're slightly offset, and they get it, they get the, um, they, they turn the snail on its back. It's called the operculum, but it's the opening. And they use their beak, they straighten their beak, which is like a corkscrew. It unscrews the snail from the shell, and then it uses its, its bill like tweezers. Now we have lost, hopefully temporarily, because the snails lay their eggs on rushes above the water level. So they require vegetation to be able to lay their eggs, and we've lost that vegetation, and thus we've lost the limpkins, now for those who don't mind being kept awake by the screaming all night, but the, yes, Anne. A couple of months ago, um, we had a golf cart um, that was going to Florida, and we had a couple of people that were going to Florida, and they 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 were And um, he took a picture just like that, but it, it looked like a muscle. He had a muscle. Okay. They, yeah. do, they, they do. They um, stayed there for a while because other people saw him. I don't know for how long. Yeah, and the, and the yelling that they do 
is they don't have cell phones and they do, they have strong pair bonds and they'll hunt uh, nocturnally. And if you listen, they'll have outside your, outside your door. And in the very distance, you can hear this tiny little response. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. So, I, and John Lampkin, I haven't seen him for a while. He's, he's old. I do know John Lampkin. What did I do with my thing here? Anyway, so we, where we are at Venice Golf and Country Club, we have lost, um, so for, emerge, for littoral shelves and emergent zones, uh, when we were built, the requirement for uh, emergent vegetation was 80%. It has since been limped lower to 65% to satisfy developers. Currently, we are someplace around 8%. And it's just not, it, there you go. So we've got to do a lot in terms of supporting our wildlife to get our ponds back to snuff. So as I said, for all the birds that feed in the pond, only a few nest, including the red-winged blackbird, and they need vegetation to do that. Um, up here you can see where they're nesting in the last year's uh, giant bulrush that uh, developed, that does leave a kind of untidy mess of vegetation, but it's perfect habitat for nesting birds. Yeah. I have to tell you, I watched this bird for 45 minutes and he never got that fish down. And the fish was beyond caring by the end. So, we go to the afternoon. Afternoon, okay, little blue heron, be careful, be careful, you never know what's lurking there. Well, this is the littoral, the littoral zones uh, come in two forms. There are shelves that go out deep. Um, the, these created ponds have different levels. They're not just as deep as possible, and they fill in over time. And then we have the emergent zone at the end, at the, at the edges. Emergent uh, vegetation has to be able to tolerate a variety of uh, fluctuation, seasonal fluctuation levels. This gives you an idea of just within a given year, uh, the fluctuations that they have to tolerate. We're gonna go through this pretty quickly, but they, they are, when you plant them, they're planted by zone. This is a way of supporting wildlife, uh, particularly the pollinators, but also it gives uh, birds a place to wade safely. It gives them a buffer. And this is what plants do in a pond. They are pretty, but they, they help prevent erosion. They absorb nutrients. Uh, you can read all of this yourself. So plants are a critical part of life in a pond. Algae, of course, oh, algae, I don't even know how to begin to talk about algae. So this is a giveaway. So if I ask you which predator in the world has the highest hit rate? Lion, tiger, bear? Dragonfly. 95% hit rate. And that is true both as adult and in the larval phase. And they do this with their tiny little brain is all dedicated to triangulation. Odonata, the toothed ones, in the Carboniferous period, these were these had a wingspan of about two to three feet, and there are a lot of reasons why that changed. Mostly, the emergence of birds as predators, so they selected for smaller size. Um, but right, they're they're pretty amazing. So we have all these different. We could just go through this a bit. I think the last time I gave this was to the Native Plant Society, so we kind of. We're a bit heavy on the plants. But anyway, so spatterdock. And it brings us to alligator flag and alligators. Now, it's called alligator flag. The idea is if it's moving, there's an alligator there, which, of course, it might be moving because there's a little breeze. But alligators, let's talk about alligators. Are they dangerous? 
Potentially, so is my car. You know, you just treat dangerous items with respect. So alligators, they have these, um, these they're called scoots, and now the, the real name for them escapes me, but there are these specialized bones in their, on their back with holes, and that's how they absorb their warmth from the sun. So because they don't have to eat all day to feed their brains what there is of them, these animals eat maybe once every two weeks. And when it gets below 70 degrees, they stop eating altogether because they don't have the body heat to digest. So on the other hand, yes, you'd be, you would be, um, you would be wary of them and you, you know, they're not making a judgment call. Is, it, is your arm a flapping bird or is it a flapping arm? They can only eat very small bites. Those huge jaws are good for one thing only, and that's snapping shut. They don't have the mobility in their jaw to chew. So all they can do is chomp and swallow. And when their mouth is closed, that flap in the back closes. So they don't really have a big throat um, channel. So unfortunately, uh, the, the law is that if somebody, f it's very subjective, if somebody feels threatened, they are threatened and the alligators will be removed. If anybody tells you they're going to be taken to a nice home and adopted, don't believe them. <laughs> they are dispatched. They cannot be relocated. They're territorial um, and wherever you go. And, and here's the stupidest part of it. If you take out one alligator, Who's gonna come back? Another alligator. It's so, um, yep. This is an apex predator. They're also a keystone species because during the drought period, they create alligator holes, which are opportunities for whole, uh, see a whole series of animals to thrive during a period where the conditions are otherwise not conducive. Now let's talk about snakes. The water snakes, and there are a number of them, uh, they're green, brown, banded with it, but the water snakes, you can identify them very readily because they all look like their mouths have been sh uh, sewn shut. Now you're probably gonna not wanna spend a whole lot of time looking at this snake, so any snake, just assume if it's near the water, you, it wants nothing to do with you, you want nothing to do with it, because even the, the water snakes, although not venomous, can inflict damage. Of course, on the side that over here is the, this, I'm not in the right angle for this at all. Anyway, so this is, this is uh, the water moccasin, now, water moccasin are harder to identify because over the course of their life, their markings change dramatically. So this is a young snake with very vivid markings. You can really call it. You can see the, the, uh, the heavy brow. This is easy to see, but this, these two are more likely what you're going to see where they just turn dark and you really don't know what you're dealing with. So what you're dealing with is a nasty venomous snake. So stay away. And then we have turtles. Uh, this turtle doesn't actually um, uh, belong in Southwest Florida, but he's too handsome to leave out. So he's a handsome devil. So this is the Florida soft shell. And you had a picture of this. If you find one in the road, stop traffic let it cross. If you must pick it up, pick it up about right here because these feet can't come forward to scratch you and these feet can't come back to get you. Um, I've done that a couple of times and learned the hard way exactly where the sweet spot is. Um, yes. And send them the way. And just, I'm going to take a little detour here. But do we have gopher tortoises here? No, um, if, you yeah, if you find a gopher tortoise on its back, which is this is the time of year you might because mating is beginning and the males are very rough and they win the TKO is by flipping the uh, 
a competitor on its back, which is of course a death sentence. So anytime you see a gopher tortoise on its back, flip it over. If you see a gopher tortoise that looks a little lost or unwell, do not take it to a preserve. Take it to a wildlife rehab center. The ones that are lost are very possibly suffering from a respiratory virus that's very contagious. And so uh, dropping it off at the local park is, is, not, is about the worst thing you could do. So now back, back on task. The red-bellied cooter, we have a number of these. The, the, the best bet if you see a, tr a little uh, aquatic turtle is going to be the peninsula cooter. And the red-eared slider is um, Florida being the, 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 I don't think it's the world capital, but it's definitely the U.S. capital of exotic species, this being one of them. So, now it gets interesting what to eat. And this is where the trophic, remember trophic, trophism, energy, food. This is now how we're gonna come through the whole system. And so here's, a, this is a pop quiz. Are these two birds the same? Yes. Nope, sorry. That's a little blue heron. And this is a tricolor. And they are, a, this was clearly a test because it's so hard. And Anne was right, it's so hard with these birds, you have to look at the, because they hide their white. They just, they're really good at hiding their white. And here you can just start seeing the picking up of that little white there. So they're both great birds. The tricolored heron, by the way, has the largest beak for its size of any of our wading birds. So where does it all begin? We begin at the beginning, we begin with the sun. It is the energy. Energy, it's all energy. Troph is energy, food, energy. They're used interchangeably. So it comes from the sun, and through the miracle of photosynthesis, we produce, we don't, we are consumers. The producers, plants, vascular, non-vascular plants, produce matter. Now that matter has very, it's not concentrated energy, it's really, uh, so the vegetarians have to eat a lot more. So who, and this, we got ourselves some algae and some cyanobacteria, they're producing oxygen. This is also good for the water because dissolved oxygen is what all of the other creatures require. So who is eating the, oh, we're still seeing, uh, um, so, uh, John, let me not digress. And so these are the kinds of bacteria, pretty much any, um, any healthy pond is gonna have all of these. It does require a microscope to see them, uh, but they're there. And who is eating the algae? The little zooplankton. And these guys have gullets, and so they are concentrating that energy that was vegetation and now it's become animal protein. It's becoming more and more concentrated, more caloric benefit per microgram. And who eats the zooplankton? Well, which is kind of like scum. Um, so our little tadpoles, some of our fish. And then that energy goes up in the water column. Now I'm gonna have to come out here to see this. <coughs> So where are you in the water column? So we talked about resource partitioning. A column of water is a resource. It's not, it's just the same values don't exist at the surface as they do down at the bottom. There are very different conditions. There are very different uh, creatures to prey on, uh, all sorts of things. So we got the dragonfly down at the bottom and our freshwater mollusks, both the evidence of each of these um, suggests very healthy water. The springtails and so forth are living mid column and then you have your surface dwellers. And then we divide the column of water by specialty. So if you're on the top, you're top dweller and you're kind of 
striding or swimming around at the surface of the water. You can't all be after the same thing. And so what we have are active hunters, that giant water bug, and the whirly gig beetle is a detritivore. The, so they're not in competition. The whirly gig is going to be taking little bits of um, vegetate, rotting vegetation that continues to float. So the whirly gig beetle has two eyes, like most animals, not all, but most. But those eyes are divided in two. So half of its eye can see above the water, and half of its eye can see below the water. Like, are you not amazed yet? Yeah, 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 yeah. This, this is something that's like, who knew? And so the same thing uh, with the predaceous diving beetle. These are beetles that do come time, sometimes come to the surface and they, they cause this like fury. It's like a bubble, just like this. And then they all go down again. So these uh, small creatures, these arthropods, have divided that column of water by specialty. And so that is how they managed to have so many, such a huge variety of species in, let's face it, a pretty small pond. Okay, this is the reason why I am never going swimming. Forget alligators, I'm never going swimming in a freshwater pond. So all of these creatures have a larval phase. Um, the crawling water beetle, that's enough to turn me off, but my favorite is the caddis fly. Down here you can see it has covered itself with little grains of silt as protection against predation. The crawling water beetle, so they're all in there. They're going through their cycle, trying not to get eaten, trying to eat something, developing ways around it. And that's a reminder that even as a larva, the dragonfly is a predaceous, uh, is a successful predator. And then, of course, coming up the food web, uh, fish are trying to eat uh, all of these small creatures. They're get, uh, sometimes they're looking for, like carp would be looking for vegetation, but mostly the fish are looking uh, for smaller creatures to eat, and uh, including the unidentified dragonfly, they'll eat the little, um, the mosquito fish, what's the mosquito fish called? Oh, it doesn't matter. Hmm. Well, we don't know. There's a, um, the Latin is, is, anyway, so the, so the fish are kind of the, 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 the alpha aquatics, but above them, of course, would be the birds. And so there we got the great blue heron. It's snatch. So that afternoon snack, never mind, which means afternoon has come to an end. So now we're going to go to the evening. Dusk. The very first bats that come out are the evening bats. At Venice area rookery, we have uh, bat houses. We have, uh, at, if ever you're down there for any reason, of an evening we have the scopes are out on the rookery and uh, docents are helping explain which birds are breeding and how and there's a, a fair bit of cannibalism goes on, cross species cannibalism. And then at dusk the bats start to come out. And it's pretty amazing, a bit stinky, but pretty nice to see. So we have uh, 13 native species they can be colonial or solitary, but they're really critical for these, um, uh, th these services on the side for bug control, pollination. Now, I would just tell you, if you come across a bat and you look at it and say, there's, there'd, there'd be a dead bat, leave it alone or pick it up with a shovel. Do not pick it up by hand. Uh, rabid bats close to death appear dead and they will bite you and that won't be good. So any bat that seems dead, don't trust it, shovel it off to the side. So these are the evening bats, they couldn't be cuter, they're not all that cute. This raffinesque big-eared bat. So they fly as many as 25 miles. They eat their own body weight. We do not need insecticides. We need more bats. It's that simple. Um, we just had a, 
nature festival at the rookery. Um, the point being is that if we if we service our the insects we have, we don't need pesticides because the insects will will have a balanced check on each other. So we do love our, our bats. If you have a home and you have a, um, palm trees and the landscape man says, oh, we're going to get you ready for the summer. We're going to give you a hurricane cut. You say, thank you. I'll be looking for another landscaper. This is the last thing you want to do for two reasons. The, the palms are not big carbon sinks like trees. These are kind of grass. They get their nutrients from the fronds. So if you cut all those live fronds off, you're depriving it. You're really stressing the tree. But more importantly, you either are destroying bats or destroying potential bat habitat, because this is where so many of them live. And at half an ounce, you can't feel it. It's not like you pick up a half pound um, frond and say, oh, sorry, there is a bat. But so just, this, this is just not necessary. So we're coming kind of close to the end of the day. This would be moonrise. And this is when we get really lively. The cicadas, now we all hear about, this is a 17 year cicada on the bottom. We hear uh, world or nationwide when these come out. Well, Florida, we have so many and they're all uh, periodic but we have cicadas every year. They're just different ones. And so, you know, the larvae go underground and they live underground. And when they get the right uh, signal, they come up. So all insects communicate. Uh, all insects communicate about mating. Other com insects communicate more complexly, like a beehive. They have very complex communications, but all, insects communicate about mating and they can do it with pheromones. You think of moths and those beautiful antennae. Um, but, but many insects do it with sound. Grasshoppers and katydids rub, they stridulate, they rub body parts together. The, it's called the tympana. They have literally washboard abs attached to very slender sets of muscles and what they do is they vibrate that so that sets up that incredible whining screech that you hear is them actually playing their washboard abs they there is a, a cicada in africa prolonged exposure will be deafening it's about as loud as a jet engine so we don't have any that loud here. But I remember birding with a, a good friend. He said, how do those cicadas start and stop together so perfectly? And the answer was, it was just one bug. That was how it happened. So we have their, they're part of our evening chorus. And of course we have frogs. Um, I don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but uh, amphibians are in serious, serious trouble worldwide. Uh, the American bullfrog is the unwitting villain in this story. It carries a, uh, a, a fungus, the name of which I cannot pronounce without a lot of prompting. But, the, uh, but bullfrogs are bred and transported across state lines and across the world for the food industry. And the, American claw, uh, the African clawed frog some of us here are old enough to remember when you had to pee in a cup and then they, they put the pee on a frog and if it laid eggs, you were pregnant. Or does anybody remember that? No. no. Well, you're not. On. No, but before, before the little tube that you peed on, the way you had the pregnancy test was to see if you killed off the frog. Well, so they shipped these frogs all over the world and of course they contain this chytrid fungus and um, so that has spread, and it's among, of course. Where, where were you from again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard this from ladies much older than myself. <laughs> but so, <laughs> so in any event, the um, the frogs are in terrible, terrible. Uh, just the, many are going extinct. 
um, I do a, I do a, a program on the Colombian exchange and how the switching of things, you know, what could possibly go wrong when you introduce new species into an environment? What could possibly go wrong? So we have the American bullfrog. Uh, one time I was leading a nature walk and somebody was like, aren't you afraid? I was like, why are you afraid? She's, can you hear that alligator? I was like, honey, honey, that would be a bullfrog. <laughs> it's okay. So we do have more uh, aquatic frogs. Of course, all frogs are uh, amphibious. Uh, they, they are only to be found in fresh water because they absorb moisture through their skin. They can't um, filter out salt, so they're only to be found in fresh water. Uh, these are all doing okay. And the spring peepers, I put them in just because they're fun. And we have invasive frogs. So the, the Cuban tree frog has really wreaked devastation with our tree frogs. And very often at night when you're out, the only tree, you're, the only frog you're hearing is the Cuban tree frog. It kind of sounds like uh, rubbing bull bearings together. And of course, the cane toad. They didn't learn from Australia. They didn't figure out that they, the creatures, that, I forget now what they were, they were like some little mice or something. They were bringing in the cane toad to eradicate this pest of the cane fields. But this pest was like living up about here and the cane toads can't get up above here. So they still have the pest and now cane toads are, and these are toxic. They have toxins in their skin. These are not, Good, but we do have them here in Florida. Fortunately, we do have predators. So you can see this barred owl making short work. I'm not sure that that is actually a cane toad. I think the cane toad would be bigger, but that does certainly look like um, a Cuban tree frog. So we do have owls. They, they not necessarily members of the pond community, of the larger pond community. We have uh, three owls in Florida. There is a fourth, but it's only rarely found in the north. So the great horned owl, which um, can be a nasty piece of work. Um, certainly it predates on other nests and will steal nests of osprey with a chick there, um, and then the eastern screech owl, which will often, sit. the great horned owl can be a cavity nester. There aren't many cavities large enough to house them, but an eastern screech owl will inhabit, and inherit and inhabit a cavity nest of maybe some woodpeckers. And so then we've got the nocturnal animals. More and more, we're hearing, and whether it's people are just more alert, or whether there is actually a change, I think it's too soon to say. But you're see, we're seeing particularly raccoons are around any time of day. It used to mean if you had a raccoon in the daytime, it had to be rabid. That's not true. Uh, they are also diurnal. The same with the coyotes. And there's, there's the female bobcat. Is it? I can, can anybody tell if she's got a cub or a rabbit? Squirrel. It's a squirrel. It's a squirrel. Yeah, so there she is. So, yeah, visit once a year from her guy, and then she's on her own. <laughs> so where we live, we have, um, we have two. We have, uh, we have two females, and they have their, their corridors, and you will see we have one on the west side and one on the east side, and they've just, we've been there a long time and um, they maybe they inherit their mother's uh, home. So we have the nocturnal animals that are rustling around at night and even the little baby animals. So this is where we kind of get a little, a little soppy. It's like, good, does it, whoever read the book, Good Night Moon? Of course we did, even to ourselves, even if we, so good night moon, this is our good night moon. So here we go, that moon is going down, and here we're going, that's into the pond, and there it is, good night pond. So any questions? Yes? I, 
I thought, or I was under the impression that the fountains were to keep mosquitoes, like mosquitoes won't breed on water that's running. Is that not true? No, it is true that mosquitoes won't breed on moving water. Um, but there are other ways to achieve that. First of all, the water is rarely still in a pond because there's always a breeze. The, uh, the, the preferred way to do it is with bubblers. And now even with micro bubblers, that it gets oxygen, it keeps the water moving, um, it's keeping the, the, the water gets hot at the surface and loses its oxygen. So this continues to circulate uh, the, the water. The thing with, um, fountains is it continues to circulate only the surface water so when you're not getting the water uh, come you know churning from the bottom and coming up and you're really not aerating the water in a in a in a way that is makes any difference so but you you are right about the foundationally mosquitoes like still water most counties in florida while we're all asleep come spray at night anyway Mm -hmm. Yes. I just wanted to know if in Kings Point they use the mosquito fish to control mosquitoes? Gambusia. That's weird. I couldn't figure out remember the name of mosquito fish, Gambusia. Do we use mosquito fish here? Yes. Some of our ponds have them, but we don't normally stock them because of the very reason that the ponds are moving water. So that's not the place where the mosquitoes are coming from. It's more likely mosquitoes are coming from a saucer in the bottom of a pot, underneath something you're growing on your patio, or I even looked at, because somebody asked me that question one day, where are the mosquitoes coming from? Uh, and uh, curled up leaves with water in them are a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So I was amazed, I sent, I sent a whole bunch of videos to the person that asked me that question. So our ponds are not the source of mosquitoes. It's, it's more standing water. It's not moving. So I don't know the configuration here of your preserves, but most preserves surround uh, one of those depressed, the wetland de um, depressed depression marsh areas, and that is where you're going to get. And that water does sit, and that's where you'll get um, <gasps> some potential for breeding mosquitoes. Um, so the, I'd like to address that issue of, of leaves. Uh, I don't know about your Audubon, but our Audubon and certainly our Native Plant Society and the Xerxes Society and Wildflower. And there's, so there's really a very big move afoot called the Leave the Leaves Campaign. And so if you've got an oak tree, sure, you might want to rake it out of your grass, but put those leaves on your flower beds. So you're doing a number of things. So you have mulch, you have water retention, you're returning nutrients slowly, but to the nutrient poor soil, and you've created a habitat for detritivores, which means your ground feeding birds are gonna be, have a lot more to eat. So leaving the leaves, I mean, to, uh, raking up and discarding leaves, or as we used to do in Maine, burn them, we now know is probably a terrible waste of a resource. Um, and it's one of those ideas that is gaining enough traction that if, like in our house, it's pretty much, we keep talking about doing some uh, mulching, but we have a lot of leaves and just it keeps all, everything down, plus those very same nutrients that were just taken out of the soil have been returned to the soil. So this isn't a question anybody asks, but I'm gonna tell you this. So you're not in Ohio, you're not in Maine, you're not in Massachusetts. Florida is very different. So when we come here and try to apply standards and procedures, processes that we're familiar with, they are very likely not going to work. There are four conditions that exist in Florida and everything here whether it is um, part of nature, it's in a preserve, or whether it's something that we install is still going to have to, with the exception of fire, going to respond to flood, because all that water falls in the summer, drought, because it's now gone back to the aquifer, 
nutrient poor soil. What we're sitting on are the Appalachian Mountains and some limestone from when we were the seabed. All the, and before we came and interfered with it, fire was the master stroke because fire would burn in the summer, it would burn coolly, it would burn from coast to coast, there weren't all these fire breaks, it would clean out the undergrowth and return nutrients to the soil. If, now what we've done is interfere by uh, suppressing fire, land managers do try to replicate that, it's very hard because uh, so many properties are near residences, but you just have to think, that we, you can't put roses in and expect them to flourish like they're in the English countryside. The can, you just have to keep in mind whatever is done here is done in a very different climate and ecosystem than we're all used to, and it has to, it has to be done bearing that in mind. So, was that a little lecture? Sorry. <laughs> okay, can you talk a little about the littoral zone? That's a new term for most people. Okay, littoral. Um, it, it, littoral, I, I wish I could give you the precise translation into English, but it means having to do with water. So you have a, a, a littoral, if you have land that's divided by a river, you, the littoral area would be right down the middle of the river. But it basically means land underwater. And I don't know your county, I do know uh, Sarasota, the Unified Development Code, not quite by heart, but I do know it. And we're required to have to, by the calculated square feet of the development, we have calculated square feet or square acreage of stormwater detention ponds. So do we, does everybody know the difference between detention and retention? I went to detention because I kept being late for school. They let me out again. If I had gone to retention, I'd still be there. So these ponds, yes. What are our ponds? Detention ponds, aren't they? On property? They should be. They should be. I think, I don't think everybody understands that the storm sewers, if you wash your car, you're going to pollute the pond. Yes, everything that runs off the road runs into the ponds. Yes, it all runs into the ponds. And this is what spells trouble for the littoral zone. So in any way, Sarasota County, they work with the developer to create these ponds. And within every pond, there's a, real, a littoral shelf. And we saw the pictures of the emergent zone and the depth tolerances of different plants. And we know that over the course of a, of a year, the, t the the water level will go up and down. So depending on all of that, planting schemes, when our community was built, the requirement was 80% had to be covered with native plants of no less than three species, probably more, and that the emergent zone around the pond also had to be planted. So what happens is a couple of things. So these plants are designed to provide habitat for wildlife, because that's what we've, re we've removed support for wildlife by building our houses. Um, the, all of the runoff from the houses, from the roads, from the uh, fertilizer, pesticides, fungicides, animal waste, uh, you name it, it's all going into the pond. And we, we refer to that mostly as pollutants, but also nutrients. Everything breaks down to phosphorus and, and nitrates. And those are the, taken up by the plants. So, so far, so good. Then the plants die. And now they're taking oxygen out of the water in order to decompose. And you're starting to build up a muck layer. So you've got these sediments in the bottom, and okay, so that's not so good either. And now we're noticing, well, we got sh we're shallowing out, and there's, uh, we're starting to get more algae than we used to. So why don't we go spray the algae? And we spray it with chelated copper, which is an herbicide, and we spray it kind of like the guy's on minimum wage, and he's spraying away, and he's spraying. And now what are the odds that you spray an herbicide and you kill plants? It's very high. And so we're killing the 
the algae, which as it dies, takes more oxygen out of the water, creates more of a muck, and we've killed more. And so next thing you know, your Venice Golf and Country Club and your littoral shells are bare and there's nothing there. So we're very lucky that, um, I hope so, nobody from Sarasota County uh, enforcement is in, the, is in the audience, but we're just, we're um, a, a well-meaning mess. And the use of, of, of algicides is, I think, one of the bigger problems that we have. But it's also people not understanding that the, what they're doing in their driveway, what there's, what's running off their roof, so we did install, um, after, as I say, after some discussion, lively discussion, we instituted at first a three foot no mow zone, which is kind of the minimum recommendation. Um, and that, one, that three foot zone very quickly became a one foot zone and very quickly disappeared. So we said, okay, we're gonna go six feet. And I'll, let me talk about that in a minute. So what happened is, when, and we let it grow. We said, we will let this grow to a height of two feet. It was not an arbitrary number. It is the natural height, the maximum height that that grass will grow. And for every inch above the soil, what do you have below? Roots. And so what we're getting is tangled roots two feet deep that will do what for us? Stabilize the bank. So instead of spending hundreds of thousands to stabilize our banks with geotubes that prove to be of little use, um, now we're saying what we're doing is stabilizing the bank with roots. We've just instituted a program where we have a geomarked um, uh, stakes so that we can actually measure whether we're getting any more erosion. So you need data. So how did our banks get to be so bad in the first place? Well, everybody wants to live at Augusta National. You remember, like, that has its own theme music? The azaleas mowed to the edge with manicured scissors. It's beautiful. I can't tell you what it costs to maintain that. And it doesn't last but the, few, the week that the, the, the Augusta National is on TV. It is utterly artificial. So, and they don't get the fluctuations that we do. So what we had done I don't know what you do here, but I can tell you what we had done is we mowed to the edge. We mowed to the edge. And we weren't doing this with little push mowers. We were doing this with big, heavy machinery that was grinding down onto the soil, onto the sh If you've got grass this high, how deep are your roots? The exact same, that you get the, it's the mirror image. So we're grinding down. We're fertilizing to the edge. We're doing all this stuff. And then the seasonal floods would come in and just cut right under and cut off the roots. And so what we had were these big dead edges. And so the dead edges had no resistance to the erosive factors of if there were fountains. There's certainly storms. There are tilapia. There are alligators that climb in and out. There are turtles that climb in and out all of which are gonna to lead to more and more erosion. And I don't know about your developer, but our developer got every square inch he could. And so we don't have backyards that are really big enough for us to build, uh, to build out. So we, uh, to build, one of the best things you can do if you got the room is to have your slope, then build a swale. As, and you can plant the swale and then have, um, plants along the edge. Of course, we did it the cheapest way possible, um, which was to just let the grass grow. And the idea would be within time, that grass would die. Because if you stop putting uh, pesticides, uh, fertilizers, herbicides, and fungicides, it can't live. You know, the, the landscape will tell you, if you stop that, you'll lose your grass and say, that's the point. 
And so what we were hoping to see was the, the, a number of wildflowers would volunteer. Well, naturally what volunteered were um, non-native invasive plants, all of which had to be taken out. The Brazilian pepper, uh, carrot wood, native plants that are aggressive, um, different ones. And then there were, and so that cost some money. And then there were people saying, well, I don't, it's bad enough with the grass, but now you've got flowers and the flowers, and then they die. And so we bit the bullet again. And we now, for three times a year, and I, I think we're gonna change it for four times a year, have a residential landscape company come in and they use, uh, help me here, uh, bush, bush. Yeah, they don't, they don't weed whack. They use <coughs> hedge trimmers, hedge trimmers. And they trim down to about 18 inches and they take all of the dead flower heads and seeds head and they drop down in where they will continue uh, to flourish. So um, it we picked our poison and this is, we really are taught, you know, it's just, it's expensive to keep putting in artificial banks that don't, that, but the same thing is that you can't get purchase in there. You, can, they, you can't, build good soil on that. So we have a variety of, yes? The no zone area is actually filtering pollutants out, is that true? Oh yes, I'm sorry, I meant to say that. So, so one of, so thank you. The, as the water comes off for every inch, so it is, um, that it's sort of the volume. So it's not just the depth, which it is, it's the height, it's a bit of both. So having it as deep as it is, in some areas we're now 10 feet, which is as far as the fellows can really manage. They can't anymore and they're gonna have a spine down the middle. Um, so th that vegetation is, is filtering out the nutrients and the pollutants. Um, the word that I was trying to think of about the bones down the back of the alligators were osteoderms. You can tell I'm getting old. These words just they come, they go. Um, yes? Does, does all of this lead to this increase in red tide? That is a great question. Does all of this lead to the increase in red tide? Let's put it this way. All of these efforts are an attempt to decrease red tide as we can keep the pollutants out of the ponds, therefore we keep them out of the watershed and therefore keeping them out of flowing into the estuaries. Um, so that, that, is, that is in part what we're trying, you know, in part what we're trying to do in Sarasota, we have an organization, the Healthy Ponds Collaborative that is funding company, uh, organizations and communities. Any studies showing an increase in red tide due to poor time management? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't put my finger on it, but it's like. I've never heard of red tide now. It's like every year it destroys the community. Yeah, let me, I'll get back to you. Let me answer this question. You're talking about red tide and those ponds that, uh, the ponds that, these giant mountains that we see, that they're so well built and they're never going to leak. You know, and they just leak into our canals and then they just leak into the bay. And they're saying that's one of the causes of the red tide. And they keep doing this and they say that they're you know, going to prevent it. I mean, and they're continuing to dig in phosphate. And I just drove down yesterday on 674 and you get to about, oh, about two miles uh, west of 39. And there's, damn, there's a crane out here. It must be the size of this room. My wife just couldn't believe it. It was like a bad movie. She <laughs> looked like one of these horror movies where these, the monsters are coming. And these cranes are just digging away. And they're not stopping anything. Those things are just continuing on. And what, what's to stop that? And that's out of my pay grade. I, 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 I you just, but. I share your horror. So let me just go back to red tide for a minute. 
Red tide if we, uh, is, a, is, a, is just a term that's used. There's Carinia brevis is a, a phytoplankton. And what it does is it observes, and it exists naturally, and it exists in different zones uh, going out from the, um, from the coast. And it absorbs nutrients. So as we pour nutrients down from, say, Lake Okeechobee or from uh, out in the Indian Lagoon, where they have primarily uh, sewage systems. Um, now, what am I? Uh, that's, uh, that's not quite the right word. Where they have um, septic. 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 Thank you. Thank you. It takes a village, doesn't it? <laughs> where they have septic, leaky septic systems. So all of those nutrients are just pouring in, um, and the, the the naturally occurring organism is just a blue. It blooming. The harmful algal blooms. And as we know, we've got starving manatees because the 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 uh, the this this phytoplankton is um, preventing the seagrass from getting the enough sunlight to photosynthesize. So that's but Florida is Florida. Florida, I just sometimes just want to just weep. But here we are. Two more questions. Two more questions. We're going to have to wrap up. Yes. Uh, I have a question that goes back to your pay grade, I think. <laughs> Does a pond completely covered with white like, lilies Sorry. benefit anything? And if not, how do you get rid of those lilies? Does a pond covered with white lilies benefit anything? The answer is yes, 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 yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, what, how does it benefit? I've heard that it cuts the oxygen off. Therefore, you don't have. No, you, you, no, you. It's just, it is. Take, it's a big uptake of nutrients. Um, they are pr pr uh, providing uh, nectar and pollen sources for insects. Um, they're beautiful. They're just beautiful. Um, we, we were also told that around here, in my whole, I've lived in Florida my whole life. All right. And when you see a lake or a pond, and they put this fountain up there, believe me, it's not for decoration unless it's in front of a hotel. They're saying that it's aerating the pond. And you're saying that it does not aerate the pond. And so I'm wondering what in the world is Well, it does, it does a little bit, but not in a meaningful way. It's because it's just recycling the top water that is already down um, the top water is the warmest. It's on the bottom, and it's pumping it, it's pumping it up and up into the air, 10, 20 feet in the air. You know, I, I really can't say absolutely, but I just know that as as technology has changed, we're moving away from fountains because the the bubblers and the micro bubblers are far more efficient. Really? But if you want a fountain that's decorative, go for it. Yeah, but no, you, no. but the the the, the, the you're not the, spending the money. The price that you're going to pay is you're going to get increased erosion if you don't if you have mo to the mo to the was that two questions I'm sorry I didn't give you a better answer but they, um, but they really but the lilies are considered uh, almost the jewel in the crown of pond plants. Are you sure they're white lilies? Cer certain lilies are invasive, certain lilies are indigenous. Okay, let me just, I, I'm gonna just give you a little uh, lesson in nomenclature. If it is native, it is aggressive. They're not invasive unless they're non-native. Now, if you're a member of the Native Plant Society, the narcissism of small differences is always on display, and we are very clear. So, if it's if it's native, it's not invasive, but it is aggressive. Now, if you want, it, like, so is uh, dog fennel, so is um, leather fern, so is salt bush. So, if you've got a plant that you say is maybe too aggressive, uh, you can thin that. But in terms of it being a bad thing for the environment, not at all. I mean, maybe, but, but also, if it's a monoculture, 
that isn't a good thing either. You want to have a variety. So you, if you've got something that's a floater, then you're gonna want some spikes and you're gonna want some high flowers, uh, maybe some golden canna. So you don't want a monoculture. Um, there have a, and it, but, but if, if it's native, which are, these white lilies are native, um, and it may be that you've got a certain, without testing the water, who's to know, but that you've got a certain uh, kind of balance of nutrients that really perfectly fit the requirements of that plant. I don't know for sure. That's that's just an educated guess. So the water can be tested? For oh, yeah. Let me, let me f f follow up with some of these things. Kate, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. It was very informative, great photographs, and, and we're welcome now, and we're lucky to have you here. Um, we need to get out of here because I'm sure they've got something else scheduled soon. Um, just a couple of quick things. Um, we have identified through the grant with the Audubon um, and with the help of the Master Association, we're looking at six ponds to do a pilot planting. Uh, some of the things that, that uh, Kate brought up uh, is important. Uh, we are doing some testing. Basically, we have done nothing to our ponds for about 50 years except spray herbicides on them and mow to the water's edge. Okay, so everything in, in making a healthy pond we have not been doing. All of our ponds and any development have to have a permit. And because our, we started back in the 60s, we had a, our permits were from the Department of Environmental Protection. The developer asked for a waiver of planting the littoral shelves and the edges of the ponds. So we have not planted that according to what our permits required because the developer asked for a waiver. It's coming back to bite us. It's coming back to bite us because of all the erosion that we have. You look at all of our ponds and even the newer sections, you start looking at the newer sections and you'll see the, the slope is like that and then all of a sudden there's a drop off. The older section, the drop off are quite severe. We're losing equipment periodically. Um, if people are fishing or kids are in there and they slip off the edge and drop down, there's a two or three foot drop off. It's dangerous, it's a liability. So after a year and a couple of months of the pond committee, we've got a whole bunch of recommendations to the master. The, and we have to make a presentation to the master and the community about that. Um, there's a whole bunch of things we need to do. Testing is one of the first things we need to do. And um, we've got, we just got approval from the master to start testing some of the ponds because we have too many nutrients. We can't control uh, what's going on because of the nutrients and we need to do some nutrient abatement in those programs. And back to the question about aerators, most of the aerators in our ponds are nano bubbles or bubblers at the bottom of the pond. And that, what that does, that stirs up the water column so you don't have a stratification uh, due to that. Whereas the fountains, they look pretty, but they don't really do that anything. Um, and again, new, new technology, new thinking, more data, more research. So that's where we are on that. If any of you, and I already had one person ask, want to volunteer to help us on the pond committee, we're always looking for, for people that want to do some work. Um, and we've got plenty to do. So I thank you so much for coming. And we will, we're, we're playing around with a, a late April seminar. I'm not sure what we're, what we're gonna come up with. The May seminar is going to be presenting to the, uh, the Sportsman's Club here because they wanna hear what we're doing with the ponds, uh, primarily because of fishing. But uh, fishing and healthy ponds go together. Thank you so much, and uh, stay dry today. And the ponds will fill up today, too. Thank you.